Welcome to the Talk and Chatter Experience about by Gasoline Alley Harley Davidson. Today's guest really doesn't need any introduction. It's two time Grand National AMA champion, Brad the Bullet Baker. Welcome, mate. Hey, thank you very much, man. Uh, it's a yeah, it's a pleasure to be on the show. It's uh yeah, it's great. I, I love Australia and it's awesome to talk to, to you guys and be on the show for sure. Mate, it's a um a thing when when I started talking to you the other other or other week, other month sort of thing about this. It's uh you got a lot of fans from from your time that you came down here and that hey. Yeah, definitely. It was his awesome experience when I came down there in early 2016 for the Troy Bayless Classic. It was it was a blast. I mean, it's a beautiful country and a lot of awesome racetracks to, to be able to ride on. And, uh, you know, the people down there, you guys are, are awesome. I know how to have a good time. And I'd already had a few friends from Australia that I'd met over here in the States. Uh, Luke Goff came over and, and, uh, and raced, uh, for quite a while in the States. And the first place that he actually ever, uh, rode at when he came to the States was my racetrack in, in Washington. And so that was cool. That was my first experience with a, with an Aussie. And I was like 12 years old on a 250. So that was neat. And then there was Mick Kirkness. He, uh, he raced for, for quite a while as well and, uh, became good friends with him. And then, uh, uh, Tommy Edwards and him and his uh, him and his father Paul came over in 2014 to race amateur nationals, and uh, I was helping the the, the the other amateur rider that uh, he was teammates with. His his uh, the dad of the kid that I was helping out was uh, helping out Paul and giving Tommy some uh, some bikes to ride, and I uh, ended up helping Tommy that whole time through the amateur nationals and in 2014 and became really good friends with Paul. And, and then, so yeah, when I came down in, in 2016, I already had some friends and it, uh, made the stay that much more enjoyable. And, uh, yeah, made, made even more friends when I was there, the, the Davies family up in, uh, Brisbane and gold coast, they're uh, great people. That's who I rode for. And, um, now I, I, I can keep keep in touch with them on a, sometimes a weekly basis. They're, they're like I say, friends forever now. Who was who that? I didn't quite catch who you said that. Which family was that? Uh, the Davies family from uh, their uh, Callan Davies. And then there's uh, Josh and Nitika and uh, yep. their, their two other kids. They're, yeah, they're from uh, from the, yeah, yeah, the Brisbane area. Uh, Troy, uh, yeah, exactly. Beautiful up there. It was awesome staying with those guys. So what happened? How, how did... Uh... How did that come about? How did you get the ride over here for that? Uh, well, I met Troy, uh, I guess it would have been later 2015. Troy uh, went to the, the Super Prestigio in Spain. Um, so he got invited and obviously I was there and, and uh, Jared Mees uh, to race the Super Prestigio and also an event there in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, Troy and I were uh, we're, we're bullshitting over some beers <laughs> at the, uh, <laughs> uh, the hotel, uh, one night. And, uh, we, 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 we became, we became good friends, uh, from that, you know, just, just talking about racing and, and connected. And, uh, he had already ran the, no, that was the first year that, that they run into the, uh, the Troy Bayless classic. And he was like, well, I'd, I'd love to have you down there, mate. And I'm like, yeah, I'd, I, I would be stoked to be down, to come down as well. And, Actually, I'm wrong on my years. So that would have been the end of 20, 2014 that uh, mm. that I met up with Troy. That that was that event um, because I actually ended up getting hurt uh, there at uh, the the Super Prestigio and in, in qualifying. I high sided in the in the last uh, qualifying session and dislocated my shoulder and broke my elbow. All the crap. And uh, since the Troy Bayless Classic was in early uh, January and that was in December, I ended up missing the, the Troy Bayless, uh, that year, but, uh, kept in touch with, with Troy and Troy actually came over and, and raced some American flat track on the Ducati, uh, in, in mm -hmm. 2015. So we spoke some more and, uh, I was all healed up for, for 2016. And so I came over, uh, for the race there in 2016. Cause that, um, that Ducati he rode, I think it was the Lloyd brothers Ducati. That was, you had to go on that for a little bit of time. Yeah. Didn't you too. Yeah, I did. That was actually the bike that I rode, uh, my rookie year in 2011. So yeah, my rookie of the year when I, uh, or when I won the rookie of the year, I, I was riding the, the, the Ducati. And so I, uh, 
I definitely had some seat time on it. It was, it wasn't the, uh, the easiest motorcycle to ride. It was, uh, you know, the hyper motard 1200 engine in it. So it made a lot of horsepower and, uh, which was good when you're on a racetrack that you could use all the torque and horsepower. But, uh, as a lot of people know on flat track, uh, the, the, the key is getting the power to the ground and sometimes having all the power in the world can, uh, hurt you more than help you. Um, so it, it had a little bit of handling issues and was a handful at a lot of places, but, uh, on the tracks where you did have some grip or some cushion to get a hold of, then you could really go fast on it and have some fun. It, um, yeah. Cause I think Troy, I think Troy maybe broke his leg on it or something as well. When he went over, I th- yeah. you have a feeling. Something yeah, he did. It yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was a uh, Sacramento mile uh, in California. Uh, it was going yeah. into turn three in Sacramento. It has a small, tiny groove, you know, that you have to stay on where all the grip is. And then it has like a sandy uh, type material to it. So anytime you get off that rubber, the groove, it's like having like polished concrete with sand on top of it. I mean, there's absolutely no grip. Seriously? So it's uh, wow. kind of thread the needle every time coming into the corner. You know, if you, if you get off that groove, I mean, you kind of yeah, kiss, kiss your ass goodbye. I mean, you're going to be trying to get it gathered up before you get into their fence. And when he got off the groove, he, uh, he slid out and I think he slid, slid into the air fence backwards. And then the bike came in and got him and, and broke his leg, I believe. Yeah, I'm pretty. Yeah, that was a um, that was a big one. As, as a compet, and you, you're a com- being a competitor your life as well. Not many tougher than Troy Bayless, hey? No, no. I was just about to say that uh, Troy Bayless is, he's man. I, he told me a lot of his stories of, of different accidents and things that he's been through over the years, and I'm like, man, this guy's been through the ringer, and and now he's you know he's fifty plus years old. It's like, I think he was just at 50 that time and he was still having get offs and, you know, breaking bones and stuff. And he'd come <laughs> back and cycle with the best of us, you know, younger, younger kids. And, uh, when I came over for the Troy Bayless classic, we have always, they have a dinner, uh, with the, uh, people that were invited down, you know, just have a dinner before the, uh, the night uh, before the race. And there's this, uh, uh, this river, this canal, you know, behind their, their house and, I think I think Jared Mees like uh, betted him that he he couldn't swim across it and back, and I mean it was yeah. ways across it, and he's like, oh, he just basically like, oh, this that's child's play, <laughs> and I was like, he he <laughs> he uh, he took off his his uh, his shirt while he's already in his board shorts and his shirt, he 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 dived in and and swam across that thing and back like it was nothing, and and he. Uh, he got out and you know how Troy is, you know, he's a little, little puffy, like, yeah, check, check out what I just did. And I said, I'm like, damn Troy, I'm impressed. And it's like, it's a, he's like, you're going to be impressed. You're, you'll be impressed even more tomorrow night, mate. Like talking about the racetrack, <laughs> he being at the races, you know, it's like, he, he, and he walked past me and I was like, okay. <laughs> but uh, some guy and accomplishments that he's, he's done in his career and then it's still, you know, doing now and now with his, his, uh, his boy, Ollie racing and looks like he's going to try to follow in the suit steps of his dad. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'm I'm fortunate enough. I get to, I, I do a lot of work for the team for those guys and, um, you know, Ollie's molded a a lot like Troy and, um, just, just a super talented kid, super humble kid. And yeah, not really a kid now. He's, he's, you know, racing super bikes. It's pretty damn cool. For sure. It's wild, man. It's crazy how fast time will fly by, you know, and like, Hey, he was, was a kid when I was there and it was only four years ago. And now it's like, uh, you can go from being uh 14 years old where you're just on a two fifty and the amateurs yeah. and now you're 18 and you're racing super bikes in only four years, you know? Yeah. It's a pretty, um, Pretty steep curve, you know, pretty steep curve in that time. So who's Brad Baker? Uh, Brad Baker is, uh, is a motorcycle racer. <laughs> That's, uh, I guess that would be the best title of me. I mean, I, I started racing motorcycles when I was, was five years old. Uh, I guess 
started riding them when I was five and started racing them when I was six. Um, and I grew up in Washington state, the Northwest corner of the United States. And, uh, yeah, just cut my teeth, uh, racing around the state of Washington, but, um, quickly started going to amateur nationals. They always have regional amateur, uh, national championships around the United States. And then, uh, they have the, uh, the grand national championship, uh, usually held in, in Illinois or Indiana. And it was held at Indiana state fairgrounds. The first time that I went where they have the, uh, legendary Indy mile. And that's, uh, I guess that would have been, yeah, one of my first grand national championship on a 50 when I was six and just steadily worked my way up the ranks from there, traveling around the United States, uh, racing motorcycles. Um, and I, when I was 15, I, I won the horizon award at the amateur nationals. That's like the, uh, the most prestigious award that you can win, uh, as an amateur racer, it basically, uh, they now call it the, the Nikki Hayden, uh, horizon award because Nikki was the one that, that won it for the first time in 97. That was the, uh, inaugural year of it so now it's been renamed the Nikki Hayden Rising Award and ever since then there's been you know obviously Nikki and then uh, Jared Meese, Briar Bauman you know the Grand National Champion or last two of the last two years Jeffrey Carver myself I mean uh, there's been uh, I think Ben Bostrom won it as well there's been a lot of riders that have won that that award um, so it's uh, yeah I won that when I was 16 or when I was 15 and then went pro when I was, when I was 16. Um, and I, uh, I won the pro class. That's uh, the singles class where everybody rides the, uh, 450 motocross bikes, you know, set up for flat track, uh, set up for flat track. And I, I won that my, my very first year when I was 16. And then, uh, the, uh, yeah, I won the rookie of the year in the expert class. That's when you step up to the, the, the twin cylinder bikes. Like I was, uh, talking about the Ducati or the Ducati that year. And, ended up six in the championship right behind Chris Carr, a legend of the sport. He was seven time grand national champion. I almost beat him in the uh, championship that year to get fifth. That would have been kind of neat, but, uh, so yeah, rookie of the year in 2011. And then, uh, two years after that, I backed it up by winning the grand national championship at 20 years old, becoming the third youngest champion of the, of the sport of flat track, which is, been going on for basically a hundred years now. So, uh, so worked who's myself through the ranks pretty dang quick. Who's ahead of you in that? I guess Jay Springsteen would be one. Who's the other? Yeah. Age wise. Jay Springsteen. Uh, and then, uh, Brad Andres, Brad Andres won it at 19 years old when his rookie year. And I think he won it in like 1954 or something. So, uh, that was a while ago, but wow. then there was a, yeah, Springer, he, he won it. He actually would have been the second and third because he won it twice before he was, yeah. when he was younger than me, he won it his rookie year and then he backed it up his second year too. So, uh, Springer man was, uh, was pretty crazy. He actually lives in the, the same town that I live now here in Michigan. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, got his helmet over here. I got a helmet right over here that has a uh, Springer number nine on it. Um, but yeah, he lives in the same town. He uh, up here in Michigan. There's a lot of hunting and fishing and and uh, different things. And Springer, he's a he's an outdoorsman and kind of a wild guy. Always fun fun time to spend with. Wow. So that was your talk, and then you went on for uh, that was on the Harley too, wasn't it? At that point, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, yeah, I wasn't riding, uh, yeah, I wasn't riding for factory Harley then I was actually riding for, uh, Dodge brothers. Uh, they're a company or a, a team company out of California, uh, that has really, really nice looking XR seven fifties and Atherton, uh, Kevin Atherton, who's national number 23, uh, Dave, his, his dad actually built my, uh, my XRs that year. And, and uh, Kevin was my and was actually my race mentor from uh, my rookie year. He worked with the uh, the Lloyd brothers, and that's where I, I um, he was the one that uh, that hooked me up with both uh, Dodge brothers and, and his father building the XRs for for 2012, and then uh, we we won the championship together in, in 2013. So that was 
that was pretty cool having having the Atherton family a part of that. And it, to me still and then uh yeah then the next year 2014 i got picked up by uh factory harley davidson and ran the number one plate with them um had some some misfortune and stuff with them there's uh um not to talk bad about harley davidson but their their motorcycles were were not the greatest at, at that year it was uh had a lot of failures and weren't necessarily the fastest. So it, uh, it, it definitely hindered my performances quite a bit. And then I also broke my, my elbow really bad at, at Colin Edwards, uh, boot camp earlier that year and in, in 2014. So I spent a lot of the year, uh, uh, riding injured with, with my left elbow, my left whole left arm, not being that strong. So between that and, and, uh, the motorcycles, not necessarily being up to par and wasn't, uh, able to, retained the number one plate in 2014 and then that's when uh, the super prestigio happened uh that was uh, at the uh beginning of 2014 actually that was uh the the first uh super prestigio that mark marquez uh uh he uh organized that they brought back the super prestigio in barcelona spain and uh i was able to go over there and, and race against him being him being the 20 year old uh mono gp world champion and me being the 20 year old uh flat track champion basically if you're the best at flat track in the united states you're the best in the world so that was pretty cool to be put on the same pedestal as, as mark marquez going over there and, and racing against him how uh how was super prestigio sorry i gonna uh super prestigio was an amazing event i uh, uh i had so much fun over there it was cool i mean just uh in Europe in general, they just, they just love motorsports and, and motorcycles to like a, a different level than here in the United States. You know, like there's so many different sports here in the U S and different sorts of entertainment. It seems like when you go to, to, to Europe, it's like football, which is soccer and MotoGP or any motorsport, you know? So it was like, um, yeah, this, the fans were, were a different level. And then, uh, then, then racing, like I said, racing against Mark Marquez and then you go over there and then they, they say, okay, this guy's, you know, they're, they're advertising, you know, uh, best in the world from America and best in, and then Marquez. And then, you know, they kind of put me on the same pedestal as, as, uh, as, as Marquez. So like they, they treated me like I was like royalty or something, you know, so that, that was, that was a pretty cool feeling, but then made a lot of, a lot of good, really good friends there too. I mean, the, the Spanish culture, Spanish people, they're, they're super nice and, and took me in with open arms and made a, a, a lot of really good friends that, that are still great friends to the day. So, uh, that the weather there is pretty good too. During the winter, you can, you can pretty much ride, uh, outdoors, you know, all throughout the winter time It's a little cold, but, uh, you can still, still ride outdoors. So there's a lot of cool racetracks and, and things to do. So, um, yeah, just had a blast while I was there and, and then I was able to go back another, uh, like three times after that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great experience and I was able to, to beat Marquez too. And, and, uh, one of the only people to say that they're, they beat Marquez that yeah. year. Uh, and, uh, so that was, that was, that was. we might have lost a bit of connection there still there mate yep, yep. so i got to okay. where you were you being able to beat marquez that year you still hear yeah me? uh yeah being able to beat marquez yeah i hear you cool you got me yeah, that was a um that was a massive thing um especially in that time he was unbeatable at pretty much everything he touched him eh? Yeah, really. I mean, it was like the guy's incredible on a motorcycle. I mean, uh, anything he rides between uh, motocross, obviously, uh, GP, supermoto, flat track. I mean, the guy's uh, incredible. I mean, he's probably the, the most talented motorcycle rider that I've ever competed against, uh, you know, behind, say, Valentino Rossi. I mean, that guy's pretty incredible on just about everything, too. But Marquez is just a, a different level as far as people are being on uh, 
just competitive to the max and, and just being talented on just about everything that he throws his leg over. So yeah, being able to, to beat him that first time. And then, um, obviously then they had to invite me back for a second year. That way he'd have a, have a go at it again, trying to beat me. And then that's when, uh, I, I hurt myself. I, I quite am high sided there in, in qualifying and, and, uh, and so he, he, he was able to win that one. He actually beat Jared Mees, uh, that year. So he, he did beat Jared, who was the number one plate. So that was, that was kind of like me sitting up in the stands, you know, looking down injured and seeing him win. I was, I was gritting my teeth, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I was able to come back again in 2015 and, and, uh, and redeem myself. I, I, in 2015, that was, that was kind of a, def, a tough year too, because I, I started off, uh, the year with, uh, with a broken shoulder, you know, dislocated shoulder and breaking my elbow for a second time and started off Daytona, you know, basically with, you know, riding with one arm. I mean, my, I shouldn't have even been racing at all because my left arm was so weak. Uh, but then I, I fought back through the year and had a couple wins in 2015. And then I, I uh, broke my leg at a, at a race in Sturgis, South Dakota. I actually got, uh, my leg got hit by a rock and, uh, I was probably going 90 miles per hour on a half mile and whatever, however fast the rock was coming back at me and the rock hit my leg and it, it broke my legs. And then I broke my leg and in, in the end of 2015 and I was, had to nurse my leg. So I had from starting with my arm to my leg. And then when I went back to the, uh, the super prestigio, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty cool to the next year I, I beat him up fair and square again. And, um, you know, to be a year later after, you know, busting up my shoulder and my elbow and coming back after that and then, then breaking my leg and then re recovering not too, you know, far before that. And then going over there and beating him again, fair and square. That was, uh, that was cool. So then obviously had to have, a uh, another super prestigio because, uh, you know, Mark is like, okay, you be, you've won twice. I've won once. And I never even really won once because you, uh, you weren't able to race because, uh, uh, because you were hurt. So we get, we got to continue. Um, and that's, what's just cool about yeah. Mark is like, he, he doesn't make any excuses and, and, uh, and he wants to, he wants to win and, and, and likes the challenge, you know? So in, in 2016, that was actually, uh, he was able to, he beat me fair and square that time. I, uh, say no excuses, but I made some mistakes on, on some things that I did for tire choice. And he, uh, him and his team every year that I, I uh, came back and they were there just more ready. You know, they, every, every year they'd make the motorcycle a little bit better. You know, they, they don't know all the, the little tricks and different things that, uh, that I do from racing it, you know, or racing flat track for years and years and, 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 and fine tuning my setup and, you know, they, they, they do a little bit of practice during the year and then set up for that race and go. But I guess when you're competing against the full MotoGP HRC team, yeah. it's not going to take them too long to figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they, they had their stuff together in 2016 and, and, and were able to, to beat me that year. And, um, uh, we were, we were set up to come, uh, come back the next year, but then, I. I, he, he would, you know, like Mark, he, he would get burnt out, you know, it's like he'd ride race MotoGP all year long. And then we go into the, the holidays and it's like, okay, now you gotta get, get geared up and, and get ready to, to race the super prestigio. And I had a couple of things, you know, injuries that I needed to attend to and, and have a surgery done. And I, I never came back over in, in 2017. And, and that's when the, uh, the, the, uh, the super prestigio, uh, stopped running, but, um, it was this yeah, amazing time during, during the, you know, those three, four years that we were able to do it. And I, uh, I actually went to, to Valentino Rossi's ranch and rode with him that last year in 2016 mm -hmm. as well. So that was, that was pretty incredible to go to, to Bulia and ride the, uh, the motor ranch with, uh, with Valentino and, and all those guys and have some fun with them as well. I was going to ask, and as a spectator, I, I watched uh, super prestigio. Did it? Did they get better each year, mm -hmm. or what happened? Because it, like it looked from the first oh. year to onwards, like it just sort of changed. Would that be correct? Oh yeah, they it, it definitely got better every year. I mean, the, those guys. I mean, they're they're professionals to the max. I mean, a, a lot of them. You know, the first time I went over, the only person that 
was anywhere close to my level was Marquez and the, and the rest of them looked like beginners. And then, uh, the, uh, right. the next year they got a little bit better. And the next year after that, they got better. But after the, the first year, that's actually kind of reunited a uh, flat track in Spain. And they actually started running some series in Spain. Um, and the, the level just at the, at the, you know, people that just race flat track were doing it and they were figuring out their motorcycles. They were training more, they were racing more. Um, and then, you know, Marquez, I was saying, you know, him and his team, they don't, they don't like getting beat at all. Uh, so, uh, Marquez started, you know, using it more for training. They started, you know, HRC started doing more with their motorcycle and like, the last year in 2016, I mean, it was a full works edition HRC bike. I mean, it was, you know, uh, basically a supercross bike, uh, you know, set up for flat track, but they, they had their own, you know, maps and stuff made, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, to get more traction. And they, they came with their, their guns drawn that year. Um, so yeah, every year that the level got better and, and now the level in Spain is great. I mean, there's, there's actually a rider from Cardus, uh, that uh, I bring over and, and sponsor him on my 450 he became really good friends of mine. Um, but he was one rider that the, from the first year, it was like, he, he was the one that had proper dirt track style out of people that, that, uh, you know, weren't GP riders. He was just, uh, uh, kind of a regular guy, so to speak, you know, and he, I noticed him the first year and he just steadily got better and better each year. And now, you know, bringing him over here to the States, I mean, he's, arguably the best TT rider that, that we have. And, uh, he can compete with the best, the best here in America. So, um, yeah, the, the level all across, uh, the board got better. And now there's, there's, there's great racers in England and in Italy and France. And it's, uh, the super prestige definitely sparked up flat track at an international level uh, from that start race in, in 2014. And it's, uh, continuing to go today. Yeah, I feel you came through at a time, um, like at your age and everything, where there was events worldwide, like say the Bayless Classic, Super Prestigio. America's always had the home of flat track, and that it was pretty cool. Like to be able to be a flat track racer and travel the world to do it, hey? Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I I never would have thought that it would have took me internationally, you know, to be able to travel the world, you know, race some more cycles. And I, it, I always thought that I was in it at a bad time, you know, like there for a while, say in the late two thousands, you know, the 2000, you know, 13 or so it was, it was, uh, you know, flat track was pretty bleak and there wasn't much going on. And then 2014 was like when there was a resurgence of it and, uh, I was just, you know, at the perfect time, you know, I was a grand national champion, 20 year old grand national champion at that time. So I was kind of the, the, the poster child of it too, you know? So yeah, being able to yeah travel the world and race a motorcycle and, and make, you know, friends from all over the world. And, and that, that was, that was an awesome time in my life and definitely experiences that I'll never forget for sure. Tell me about the Rossi ranch slippery uh not what was it like it yeah slick. Slip, slippery yeah you, you got it right there it's it's uh it's uh-huh. crazy slippery um so daytona short track that we always start out the uh, the series over here is a very very slippery surface as well just to daytona till i went to the ross train it's uh yeah it's, it's just like a very like hard a uh, very hard pack surf like a like a sandy shale type surface to it um wow. and it's the it's it's, it's kind of gets it gets slimy like when it's when it's dry it's like hard packed with uh with 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 dry sand on top of it and when it's wet it's like slippery slimy you know so and then then you show throw it in it's like a road course you know the uh the, the the main bigger track uh the fastest lap time around it has been two minutes and four seconds so pretty pretty wow. long lap time for a dirt track or really yeah. long drive lap time for a dirt track at that you know um so then it's off camber uphill downhill and then it has that slippery surface at the same time so i mean it is by far the most technical racetrack that i've ever rode on um so those guys, them training there, it's, I mean, it's a, 
it's a great place for them to train. I mean, as far as, you know, physically and just uh, good bike control uh, period. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great place for training. Um, but they're, they're, they're no joke. I mean, those guys are fast and I mean, they're fast cause they, they're, they're great. You know, some of the best motorcycle racers in the world period, but you know, they, they train there, you know, sometimes several times a week and they've done it for years now. So if for somebody to be an outsider and come in there, that's never, you know, rode there before, uh, you have your hands full against them cause they're, they're fast and they got the place figured out, you know? So, um, I didn't get to do too many laps on the, uh, on the bigger circuit, the, 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 the main, you know, cl- uh, circuit that they run like their, uh, hundred kilometer race that they do every December. Um, it was yeah. kind of, it was a December day or no late November day. So it was kind of wet out and, and it was getting pretty dry early. Um, it, uh, one moment, let me decline a call coming in. Sorry guys. No worries. Um, but, uh, anyhow, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was getting kind of late in the day, uh, uh, Valentino had actually been testing in, in Malaysia and, uh, he, he had got kind of in pretty, he took a red eye flight. So he got in that morning. So he, he was, he took a nap that morning and then we were going out to the, the racetrack that afternoon and it, it had rained the whole day before. So the track was that, that slimy slippery all the way around, you know, and, um, yep. we, uh, we started out on the, on the main big course. And I, I think I, I set uh, fourth fastest time that day, which was a lot slower than, than the fastest lap time that had ever been around there just cause it was super, you know, slick and slimy from it being wet so much, but I had, I had fourth fastest time. It was, uh, Luca Marini, uh, uh, Valentino's brother, you know, he was, uh, he set fastest yeah. time that day. And then it was, uh, Frankie Mortabelli. He, uh, he had second fastest time. Then it was, uh, Valentino and myself. And I was right there close to those guys in time. So I think they immediately we were like, wow, this guy, you know, I, I think I had 16 laps around the track. 16 laps and I was fourth. So close that close to him. And then we was getting late in the day and they always have a, uh, uh, an Americano race. So they have the, the center part of the racetrack. They got like a quarter mile oval. And then, uh, so you come on off a of turn two, it has a 180 degree left-hander, 180 degree right-hander, you know, into the infield and then you go back around and then you make a another right hander and then 180 degree left hander and you enter the track back on to where you'd be entering turn one of the short track and then you go on around but uh they call that americano because it's more similar to you know the types of racetracks that say we'd run here in, in yep. america and uh they they split the, the 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 everybody up in groups so you'd have um two heat races and i i believe you had to get uh uh, I forget what, what place you had to get in, in your heat race to be able to transfer to a semifinal. I think it was like top five or six or something you had to, to make it to, uh, to, and then they'd run two heat races per group. So you had to get top five or six and they'd take the points and that would uh, transfer you to a uh, semifinal. And mm-hmm. I was in uh, separate heat races uh, to Valentino, but I, I won both my heat races. Um, I think I was battling with, uh, uh, Frankie Mortabelli in the one and, and, uh, and I was able to beat him. Uh, so then we go to the, uh, the semifinal and that's when the first time I got to, you know, to face off against Valentino and I, he, he got the whole shot. He got the whole shot. And, uh, I think it might've been Luca Marini in second. And I, uh, I got off the line, uh, kind of crappy. I, I had some difficulties with my clutch going on, so I wasn't getting off the line uh, very well. And I was able to, to work my way into second and, and, uh, Valentino was leading and it was the, uh, second, the last lap, there were only six lap races. So you had to, you had to, to, to make moves pretty quickly. And I, I, uh, I passed him going into that, that first tight left-hander, I, I squared him up and slid underneath him going into that, that, that first tight left-hander, uh, and got by him for the lead. 
And then when we were going into the, the right hander, uh, in the infield, uh, before you come back onto the short track, uh, Valentino, they, they got, they got videos of it on, uh, on on youtube but uh he's coming into the right hander and he's trying to make up time on me and he's he- heavy on the front brakes trying to make up time and from how slick it was and kind of off camber he he tucked the front and and crashed and uh which obviously gave gave the win to me but uh luckily i'd al- i'd already passed him before that so uh so i, so I got the semi-final win and the way the rules should have been is that you know, you, you had to get a certain, you know, position in your semifinal uh, before to, to stage you up for your your final. So, yeah. you know, I obviously won, so I should have started up front and Valentino should have started in the back, but we wanted to race me and I wanted to race me too. So Valentino started up front front with me and then uh, in the uh, in the final and we uh i got another crap start because i said i had some stuff going on with my my clutch and and he he got the lead and and it was it was like the start of the first uh or a second lap and and i i got myself in the second and I, and i passed him in the same place that i had passed him before going into that first tight left hander and then I I don't know. There, it was probably a little bit of jitters or something, you know, like because uh, uh, maybe I was excited that oh, fuck, I just I just passed Valentino. I was like, <laughs> I got this thing, you know, and and yeah. even though there's two laps left, but I was like, I got I'm in the lead. All right, cool. And uh, we were coming out of that 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 first right hander, and I just got on the gas too hard, and I, and I thing came around on me, and I had to check up because I was either it was gonna high side me, you know, so I had to check up, and I. I bobbled big time, almost high sided, and, and that let him go back, get back by me. And and the final was actually only four laps long, so you really had to to make up, you know, yeah. moves quick. And so he gets back by me, and we go go around the next lap, and and, and I catch back up to him, and I'm and I'm there, and uh, but it's not quite close enough. So on the last lap, going in that that you know right hander in the infield that that he crashed before, I go in there and I and I. And you know, trying to make up time like he did, and I got super sideways in the middle of the corner and, and almost high sided again and, and saved it, but uh, was able to come home second behind him. But uh, so I didn't beat Valentino on his home turf, but uh, I got pretty pretty dang close to it. But it would have been it would have been pretty cool to say that I, that I beat him at his home turf, but he he got me that time. To beat uh, Mark Marquez in Spain and Valentino in Italy, that would have been pretty cool. I know I was I was close to it I was really close to it but that's actually a Valentino Rossi helmet down there um you know Valentino he's a he's an awesome guy like you you would think you know the most popular motorcycle racer in the world you know the guy would be you know on a pedestal or something but uh you know uh after the races that or after the race that day you know they got the the, the, the commons area where everybody gets geared up and they have barbecues and hang out and and uh we we had a barbecue and then went inside and they they have uh uh you know where they can watch race film the whole you know they they got uh, people that take you know the video all the way around there and then you can go in later when everybody's eating and having beers and hanging out you know you can watch the film from the day that way everybody can you know talk races and and jab elbows and stuff at each other you know it's it's pretty cool and and they they were you know asking me questions on how you do this and how you do that and you know they were uh just you know just motorcycle racers just like you and i you know it doesn't, doesn't yeah, just matter you know they're just they just you might have just won nine world championships but yeah but they're they're just cool dudes just like just like us just just like to race motorcycles and have fun yeah like you're a grand national champ. So basically that's classed as a world champ in my level. What happens? Does Valentino Rossi just slide into your DMs and say, Hey, uh, do you want to come and ride at the, at the ranch or what actually happens? How does that work? <laughs> uh, it, a little bit, but uh, it, it kind of went like that. It was, uh, so Sammy Halbert, you know, uh, yep. national number 69, he, uh, he came, he came to the ranch uh, with me that time. Mm-hmm. And 
he 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 didn't have the greatest shake at it. He he had caught a bunch of jet lag and and wasn't feeling good and and hadn't ate that well and not very much sleep and he was off his game that day. But uh, anyhow, there was a flat track live. You guys have pro- probably followed yep. flat track live. Uh, she Miriam Geicher, she uh, always posted a lot of uh, videos and stuff of, of different races all around the United States and. Uh, there was a, a, a race in Southern California, Willow Springs, where it was a really cool racetrack and, and made for some great racing. And Sammy and I always had uh, killer races there um, where we just have yeah, uh, intense battles. And it was, uh, it was Miriam had posted it and uh, on Flat Track Live and uh, Valentino um, commented on it. And it was just like, uh, spectacular racing would, would, would love to have both of you at the ranch someday. And, uh, we're like, well, check that out. You know? <laughs> so, uh, I had, uh, so yeah, I was like, okay. I, I so I just, I just commented on it and said, yeah, I'd love to. And then, uh, he, he private messaged me and, and said, uh, yeah, any, uh, anytime you want to come to, to Italy, you're, you're more than welcome. And I'm like, cool all right uh, wow. awesome pretty pretty cool to have uh, an invite to by the champ to uh yeah to, to come race at his uh, ride at his track so it was probably a a year or two before things kind of lined up to where it could do it and then uh yeah heck we made it happen then when i was already over there for the super prestigio and and now like sammy he's been over every year since and, and gone over a couple times and raced the the uh you know the 100 kilometer race and unfortunately you know like that like i said that next year i had to you know surgeries that i needed to get done in 2017 and and didn't come back over uh and then in 2018 i had my injury and and uh now the rest is history but at least i was able to to say i went there the one time and you did it and got the race with them and and uh and i did it and and i and i almost almost beat him i mean i i beat the rest of them like hey franco moto barely he I mean he's fast really fast yeah. there and so is luca and and all those guys so and then i almost beat him so i feel like if i could could go back for the uh, 100 kilometer race that i i i could have put uh put in a good result and, and and possibly won that race but uh it's tough though i mean those like uh, those guys are world-class athletes and and they ride there all the time so they got it they got it figured out big time for sure I, I don't know how much you follow MotoGP, but you're a motorcycle nut, so you probably do. But what Valentino's done with the Rider Academy oh, yeah. has helped, like, Italians in GP, like, so much. You know, We're, the last sort of uh, 10, 12 years, it's been such a Spanish-influenced uh, Grand Prix. But now, obviously, with the Riders Academy and that, there's so For many sure. more Italians that have come through, hey? Yeah, there really has. I mean, uh, yeah, I, f- I follow MotoGP uh, every weekend. I'm in a MotoGP poll and and yep. yeah, follow it and and been able to 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 meet a lot of the racers personally and know them. So yeah, that makes it even funner to yeah, cool. to follow it and watch it now. But uh, yeah, definitely definitely has had a huge impact on it. I mean, uh, see, I mean, look at at, at Frankie, you know, winning uh, a couple yep. GPs this year, and and uh, he's one of the guys, and now. Uh, his younger brother Luca is going to yep. be in the the GP class next year, and Thank then you look back all the way through the the Sky program. Yeah, the the VP, the yeah, the VR forty six uh, uh, team. You know, there's a lot of a lot of riders that are coming up through Moto three and Moto two, and mm-hmm. they're going to be you know yeah the future Moto B riders here before for too long. So yeah, Valentino's had a huge impact on that for sure. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree anymore. Like, it's been uh, the legacy that he'll leave, like, nine times champ, hopefully one day ten. But, um, yeah, and, and then obviously doing this academy stuff's huge. So why um, why flat track? Yeah. It's, For you, originally. What put you into flat track? Why uh, was it? I, yeah, my, my uh, yeah, it's a great question, man. I should have said that from the get-go. My uh, my father uh, got me into to racing flat track. My, my dad raced... Uh, flat track when when he was in his 20s and uh he he uh asked me one day i remember him asking me too if i if i would like to to, to ride a motorcycle and uh i said yeah my, my dad uh drove drove logging truck hauled, hauled logs for a living and i remember uh the day that he pulled into the uh 
to the driveway with a little PW Yamaha 50 on the chain deck of his log truck. And, um, uh, we had a, a 10 acre field in, in front of the house and it wasn't, uh, wasn't very long after that, the, uh, the 10 acre field became a, a 10 acre racetrack. Wow. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's this, there's a lot of racing, uh, flat track racing through, through Washington. There was, there's a pretty good level of riders there. Um, and yeah, since my dad had raced flat track, uh, and knew some people, he, he took me, uh, yeah, took me my first race and it was a flat track race. And, um, I was pretty much immediately hooked from that. I mean, uh, just, you know, obviously what you start off at doing and, and, uh, and I was good at it, you know, and everybody you know, is, uh, you know, likes what they're, they're good at. I mean, I, I, I rode some motocross and some different things, you know, just, just cross training and, and trying different things out. But, uh, I never, I always just love the speed uh, of flat track and, and especially the slide of the bike, you know, you're drifting the motorcycle and there's nothing, you know, no better feeling than, than sliding the motorcycle around that. That's, that's what I loved, you know, uh, about it. And that's, I think that's what, what drew to drew me to it the most was this was the, the feeling of sliding the motorcycle. And, and that's sort of um, like in your racing time where you're at home, like on the cushion tracks fast, like, that that was your home, wasn't it? Really? For sure. Now you're you're right about that. Yeah, on, on cushion tracks or any any track where you could steer the motorcycle with with the rear tire, you know, like uh, where you you could ride really really hard and and uh, slide the motorcycle into the corner, running into the corner, you know, super far. Sometimes never letting off, and yeah. just you know, pitch the bike sideways, kind of like a speedway bike, and uh, and steer with the throttle and steer it with the rear tire. And that was, that was definitely the types of racetracks that, that suited my style. And, and yeah, from, from the get go. Yeah. I, I loved, loved the feeling of, of, of sliding the motorcycle like that. And it just transferred all the way into, to, to when I turned pro and it became yeah, the, the tracks that I was best at for sure. How, how, um, in your opinion, how is that feeling? Like when you're just coming in, not maybe not butting up but at all, What's it like? It's a rush. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a super rush. I mean, uh, it's, you kind of, it's crazy too, because uh, on flat track, you know, there's no runoff, you know, it's like, it's not like we have, you know, a corner where you got, you know, hundreds of feet of runoff. I mean, you're, you're aiming literally towards guardrails, you know, fence posts, poles, everything, you know, and um, you know, it, you got to be this fully committed to be, you know, uh, wide open at, you know, 80 to hundred miles per hour and just start to lean the motorcycle over. When you start to lean the motorcycle over and it gets on the smaller track, you know, part of the tire, that's when you start to get some wheel spin and the bike will start to bust sideways, you know, but it just takes full commitment of, of knowing that, Hey, I got to keep this thing wide open. But if I start to, to lean this thing over on the side and to turn, the, the motorcycle will come around and start to turn, you know? So it's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a hard one to really explain, but, uh, there's no, no better feeling in the world than they yeah, just holding it wide open and, and running into the corner super deep and, and busting the thing off sideways and keeping it on the car, on the gas and being only a couple feet from the air fence and, and just, uh, yeah, letting it, letting it all hang out. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, it just, it just looks so uh, un- unobtainable for people. You know what I mean? If if that makes yeah. sense, like for the for the average Joe rider to watch to watch some of the, like your old videos and stuff of you know 2010 to right through 2018, you're just like, how, how does one obtain the skill level to get to that point? You know? Yeah. I mean, I don't even necessarily have the answer for it either, other than it's this, it's this experience and doing it really. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I look back through my, my kind of my career and just see the way that I, I progressed, you know, and it's just like, it was a, a quick c- progression. And I think this something, this clicks, you know, and I, a lot of us, you know, it's like, how did, how did Mark Marquez get to that level? How did, how did, uh, Eli Tomac get to his level? You know, it's like really, it just was persistence, you know, riding the motorcycle all the time, training all the time, 
and just living nothing but, you know, motorcycles. And, yeah. and that's really the only way you're ever going to get to that level is, 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 is just doing nothing but that and, and putting everything that you have into it. Through, through coming through from sort of like, uh, let's say, how, beginnings, you're probably racing out of a box van for, you know, st- that's how people start yeah. racing. What does it feel like day one going into a factory team? Yeah. What's that like? <laughs> it feels pretty cool, man. I mean, it, it feels really cool. I mean, it feels like everything that, you know, you've you've worked for, everything that you've been through, you know, has is, is, is really finally paid off you know uh um because you know a lot of times you know we we don't do it you know because we're thinking that we're gonna make a bunch of money one day doing it you know it's uh you do it because you love it and it's more for the the pride uh more so than anything um so yeah when you uh I mean, the year that I won the championship I literally had a, a 1995 a Conaline extended van and a little 12 foot trailer behind it. And that's the way I won the grand national championship. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to say that I, I won a grand national championship that way. than I did, you know, racing for a factory team because mm. that really just shows kind of the, the grit and determination that I had in that, that it didn't take a factory team and a bunch of money to, to win the grand national championship. I mean, uh, all, all it really takes is a, a lot of heart and desire and, and that's all it takes, you know, and then that's all it takes even at the factory level too, you know, so you can have all the best equipment and then the, the money in the world. But if you don't have the passion and the desire, you know, that's, 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 that's the biggest thing, you know? So, but when I, when I did go factory, you know, get on the factory and I was not having to drive myself all around the United States and, uh, you know, living out of my van and things like that. And I was actually getting, getting paid to, to, to race my motorcycle. I mean, that was, wow. that was, that was, that was awesome. You know, and then I was, then I was actually make a living, you know, it's like, there's not very many people that can say that they, they made a living, uh, you know, racing their motorcycle. So mm. it was, it was a gratifying feeling to say the least for sure. When the, um, when the FTR came in, so you, when did you go on that? That was uh, 16. Is that right? 17, 17, FTR? 17 was, uh, yeah, it was announced at the end. Of the yep, event. yep. Seventeens when Indian came. That was a huge. Change. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, six. Uh, yeah. And, oh, for sure. Yeah, Indian. Indian definitely changed the game uh, in flat track for sure. I mean, they uh, they 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 put all their their eggs in one basket and 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 produce a, a, a modern day purpose built race bike and and it. Uh, it's yeah like i said it's changed the game i mean there's no more cycle that's better than it now i mean the xr 750 the harley davidson xr 750 i mean that was the bike for for so many years um but uh but it was getting old and outdated you know it was originally designed in 1972 so for that motorcycle to have as long a run as it, it did you know to to still be competitive i mean it it could still be competitive now to now today too i mean it's it's still an awesome bike and this would be you know, down on horsepower and a little bit lack of acceleration on the miles, but on the half miles, it would, it'd still be there. But, uh, you know, but the FTR just as an overall, uh, as a whole, the motorcycle's better for TTs and it has that extra acceleration on the, and over rev, uh, everywhere, but it still has that forgiving power that just makes the, the motorcycle very, very easily to ride. So yeah, when, uh, when when they came out with it, it was uh, it, it was a treat, man. It's a, it's a blast to, to to ride, and the the Indian guys are just uh, are are really really cool to work for too. So it was, yeah, it's been the, the Indian FTRs is is pretty cool. That that that's for sure. Uh, it, when it came out, I was like, it's going to shake things up for the sport, and it certainly did. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's 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 made it hard for anything else to compete against it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, unless, uh, unless another manufacturer comes out and, and, and does a very similar thing and, and develops a purpose built race bike, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's virtually pretty, pretty hard to be able to compete against it. Um, you know, there's a couple, you know, uh, the, the, the Harley, the, the Yamaha, the Cowie, I mean, they can, 
they can they show glimpses of greatness, you know, come up and, and compete against it every now and then. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, as an overall whole, there's, there's not a better motorcycle anymore for sure. So it'd be, it'd be nice to see one of these other manufacturers go, you know, back to the drawing board and, and, uh, and produce a, a purpose built race bike, but it's, there's a lot of money and time, mm-hmm. you know, and especially money to, to, to develop that motorcycle, you know, and, and, and they, and they did it properly, you know, it wasn't just obviously spending the money to do it. Anybody can spend a bunch of money, but they're not going to get what they need. They just, they, they, they put the money in all the right areas and, and develop the bike that is, is great. So they, yeah, Indian, Indian did their homework and, and they came out with a bike that was, that was, that was ready to win races right away for sure. Do you, so what, you were 20 when you won your grand, your last grand national. So what are you now? 28? 27. So yeah, I won, Last Grand National Championship, yeah, was it was in in was uh yeah 2013. So um, yeah, except seven years ago now. But then, won my last Grand National was actually uh, the last race in 2016. There when when they uh, debuted the the FTR 750, uh, yeah. and that was at the the Santa Rosa Mile. And so I I, I won the last race for for Harley Davidson before. Uh, Indian kind of took the reins uh, from everybody in 2017. I was already signed on for, for them, uh, in, uh, for, for 2017 at the end of 2016. So when I seen how, how well that motorcycle went with, with Joe cop riding and that was a debut for it, uh, yeah. how, how well it, it, it was. I mean, I raced in the heat, my heat race there at Santa Rosa, Joe cop was in the same heat race. And I, uh, he, he passed me on the back stretch, like on the second lap and, he passed me like I was tied to a pole. Like it just, Seriously? It, 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 he, he blew my paint off. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just, he, it, the thing had horsepower over, over the XR big time. So it was like, I was like, it was one of the only times that I've smiled or laughed at, you know, at another motorcycle <laughs> passing me that, that easily, you know, I was like, cause I was like, Oh yeah, I'm going to be racing that bike next year. <laughs> you know, I was like, I it was cool to see, cool to see what it, what it, uh, what it had, you know, what it had in store, but, uh, um, and then obviously the, I, I was able to win the the main event that day. Uh, and I won it by like 10 and a half seconds. I mean, I, I, I demolished the competition that day. I was yeah. the only one that kind of had the, uh, had the balls to be able to hold it wide open all the way around and be up by the, uh, the air fence where it was still smooth. So, um, yeah, I won, won the last race for, for Factory Harley, and then the, the next year is when we went, went racing for Indian. And then uh, Jared Mees, Brian Smith, and myself were were the three riders that, that completed the, the, the Indian wrecking crew. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we won. We won. Yeah, went one, two, three in the championship the first year for Indian. And that was, that, was, that was a pretty big statement, to say the least. Yeah, that's it. And it was marketed so well, like with the, the wrecking crew title, everything, like, well, no, it was uh, it was just such a change, you know. It was a change of the guard. Yeah, it, it definitely was, man. I mean, the, the wrecking crew that was they had the original wrecking crew back in, you know, the the late late forties, early fifties, and you know when those guys uh, showed up at the racetrack, I mean, they knew that uh, they were racing for fourth. <laughs> you know, it's like the, those guys, you know, demolished the competition back then as well. So. Yeah. For for Indian to kind of renew the heritage and then bring it back out again with the with a new motorcycle that was ready to win uh, again it was yeah it was it was pretty cool like I said it was a change in the guard and now that they, they got the uh, the Indian as a production bike to where um, you know all the the teams uh, have got one and now I mean it's really like, Hey, if you don't have an Indian, you're, you're, uh, you're not going to be able to win or you're not going to be in contention to win for a grand national championship at least. So, um, yeah, they, they definitely have, they've taken the sport by storm for sure. Had you, um, had you signed on with Indian without seeing it turn a wheel? And was that a gamble? I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a little bit of a gamble. Yeah, it definitely was. I mean, uh, but I just knew 
so SNS Cycle uh, mm-hmm. was uh, is a company that builds the chassis and uh, all the electronics and assembles the bikes and, and and was a big part of the the development of that that motorcycle and um, yeah. Paul Langley who was the president of SNS uh, had a virtual uh, uh, meeting with me uh, mid 2016 and he had all the blueprints for the uh, the engine and and explain what they were doing what they were doing for testing and they had you know uh, kenny tolbert uh and jared mees uh as as the main team developing the motorcycle and i mean i i know Ken, kenny tolbert was uh, the crew chief for chris carr for for all of his years and and i rode for for kenny a little bit in the beginning of 2012 so i knew the I knew the, uh, the, the, the savviness of, of Kenny. And then obviously with, with Jared is, you know, great racer as well. And, uh, you know, them, them basing it off of, uh, the XR 750 after every single national, they would rent the racetrack and then set a baseline lap time and feel off the XR 750 and then go out and test the, the FTR, you know, right after and compare and develop it based off of that. So, Really, I knew that, you know, with, with Jared and Kenny being committed to it and it's everything that they, they were doing that it's like, there's, there's no way that this motorcycle is not going to be the, you know, not going to be the bike. Like it's not going to, like, a, it was basically a, a fail proof plan that this motorcycle is going to be awesome. You know? So, uh, with hearing all that, I was like, um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to sign for that. That, that, that's, that's going to be a good motorcycle. And I knew that you know, with what Harley had in their plans and compared to what Indian had with their plans, that Indian's program was just a lot better than what the, that Harley had to offer for sure. Wow. So, yeah, it was like, uh, you know, seeing, seeing it here in press releases and that, like, oh, I wonder what it would be like once it hits the ground. And yeah, it's sort of uh, three years on, it's proved its point. Oh, definitely. It sure has. And then Indian developing the, uh, the FTR 1200, you know, like the, the street tracker version of it. I mean, that's a, that's a killer motorcycle as well. Um, and they, they're really smart how they developed, uh, yeah, that, that, that 1200 to where, you know, the people could go out and buy something that was, uh, you know, similar to a race bike, but, uh, but, you know, built for the street and you could also go, you know, on road, off road with it and, and have a lot of fun with that 1200 as well. So yeah, Indians, Indians whole marketing strategy and everything that they did with it was, was, was pretty spot on for sure. Yeah. Did you, um, so you're, you're 27 now going back to what I was asking you about your age. Did you ever think that you compete at the X games or see flat track come to the X games? Like you're in an age group where you would have seen no, I never thought <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. That was, that was cool. And when we, we, we found out that flat track was going to be, you know, uh, possibly a part of the X games. And I never thought that it would be in the X games. I mean, yeah, you grow up as a kid watching the X games and, yeah. and, uh, you know, they, they had a little bit of supermoto in there and, you know, those were all supercross motocross racers, you know, and, and then they, you know, but a lot of times you think of, you know, backflips and and and, mm-hmm. and and fmx stuff you know travis pastrana and then and for as far as motorcycles go you know and then obviously the rest is 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 uh skateboards and things like that and so yeah i never really thought that we'd ever be on espn with, with flat track racing but uh that was at a good time too because they started you know harley davidson was the main sponsor of, of x games it, you know flat mm-hmm. track being in the x games and they started that campaign in 2014, which was the year that I had the number one plate and and uh, started riding for Harley. So through that whole process, I got to be kind of the, the poster child and the, and the spokesman for both Harley Davidson and Flat Track. So that was that was awesome to 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 be a part of that and do that, and then to go there and and, and be able to compete, you know, and be you know. Uh, uh, at the same, you know, on the same level as these, these world-class athletes of so many different sporting disciplines was, mm. was super cool. And then I, I was able to, to get a, uh, you know, a couple medals doing it as well. So say, so yeah, there was a X games medalist and, and on ESPN, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty awesome to say that, that I was part of that as well. 
Oh, it's just awesome for the sport in, as well. Like it was, uh, you know, sitting back here in Australia, seeing, we had Michael Kirkness go back over and just seeing some, you know, the sport in, in the spotlight with such good coverage um, was huge. Yeah, no, it was it was definitely huge. I mean, it wasn't until like say pre X game, say you you had somebody ask, okay, what what do you do? Like, if, you know, like what type of racing you do? You know, they'd always say, oh, you you, you ride motocross, and like, yeah. no, I, I race flat track. And like before the X games, was like, oh, I, I race flat track, and then I'd immediately go into like explaining what it was because I really just already knew that they didn't know what it was, you know, and. Yeah after the x games i would say uh oh, race flat track and then they they would say oh hey i seen that or i know what that is you know it's like oh really like cool so like at least like people and any time now like it's not very many people that i you know say like hey you know I'll race flat track they're like oh yeah heck i've seen that before for sure so it, it definitely helped just put flat track back on the map for sure yeah no i, I definitely feel that as well hey, look Look at the coverage now, which you obviously do some commentary in as well. The coverage of the AFT now is as good as the X Games coverage. What like it's sort of just it's so good now. Like anyone can watch it in the world. Um, yeah, isn't it good? Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, it's it's uh, yeah, flat track is has made such a big resurgence since then and like you said it's uh it's it's similar to what they have what they did with the, the x games i mean it's on nbc sports and nbc yep. sports gold where you can watch it live from anywhere around the united states and then obviously uh social media helps so much now like social mm -hmm. media has came so far and just a short amount of time as well so when you have it, a, a live stream like that and then you, everybody's sharing it on social media and it spreads like wildfire around the world and and, and then there's you know uh, hundreds of thousands of viewers you know looking at it so it's uh that's it's awesome for sure it's it's definitely you know helped flat track out uh, greatly and um yeah it's just been been a pleasure to be a part of it and, and and just glad to say that i had something to do with helping it get there you know yeah you had a huge i think i feel you had a huge um input to where it is currently like uh you know, it's a name that carries around the world within the sport. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, it's uh, definitely something to be proud of. I'm, um, I'm, yeah, just like I said, glad that I was being able to be a part of it and, and still a part of it. It's, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's uh, what I love to do and what I have the most passion, passion for, you know. So, mate, let's touch on the injury. Tell me about that. What, what's the, what, 2018? Obviously X Games, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20, 2018, uh, July twenty second at the uh, at the X Games. Um, yeah, heck, I I I just gotten back from from England uh, in in twenty eighteen. We uh, were invited to the uh, Goodwood Festival of Speed over there in England, and that was that was an awesome event to to go to and to be a part of and to have flat track a part of that as well that was another yeah cool event to do mm -hmm. ever think that uh they yeah that was uh so yeah 2018 yeah they they uh they invited uh myself jared mees briar bauman jeffrey carver uh chad coast and shana texter and then oliver brindley uh from england uh we we all um we we all went over there and and uh, if it, anybody's not familiar with the Goodwood Festival of Speed, but it's this kind of a, a rich family, uh, royal family uh, of England and uh, the the Goodwood uh, like royal mansion. They has a big long driveway up to it and um, it has basically, you know, F1 cars from past and current to NASCAR for, for cars and bikes. You know, they have something there to and and you know past and current you know uh heroes legends of the sports to to, to start at the bottom of the driveway and, and ride to the top and do wheelies and burnouts and wave to the fans and then just kind of put on a show and they got cool vendors and different things i think there's like two hundred thousand people or something there each day it's a week-long event like it's a it's a huge event so like to be a part of it, you know, flat track, be a part of it. 
was super cool. And then, uh, you know, they, they got, uh, the, the Royal party where everybody, you know, dresses up in tuxes and goes there and has a party and cool things, you know, it's like, it was just, yeah, neat. Very, very cool to, uh, to be a, a part of that as well. And to flat track, to, to be a part of that. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. I, I like, you might've picked up on already. I, I follow the sport so intensely. I love it so much. Right. I, I didn't know that. That's, um, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was cool, man. I got, got some cool, uh, pictures of, doing wheelies and stuff up the hill and doing a, uh, a cool burnout and stuff at the top. And, uh, yeah, I got the, uh, I meant, uh, oh, Jonathan Ray from, uh, you know, world Superbike champion at him and, uh, met, uh, Bobby Labonte, um, that, uh, was NASCAR driver. And I was always a fan of him when I was younger. So it was cool, cool meeting him and stuff. So, um, yeah, no, it was just really, really awesome to, that flat track was a part of it, but, uh, yeah, le- leading back into the X game. So I, I just, yep. just gotten back from, from England and, and, uh, uh, my, my best friend, um, lives in Minnesota. That's where the, the X games, uh, was, you know, so I, I spent a lot of time in, 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 in Minnesota with him just being, you know, closer to a lot of the races and stuff. So, uh, Minnesota was kind of, a another, another home for me, so to speak, a place where I'd, I'd spent a lot of time. Um, so I, 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 had a really good feeling going into the X games that year. Like I was bound and determined to, to get gold just cause I'd, I'd finished, uh, you know, bronze three years in a row and, and, uh, had, you know, good times and good, you know, positions to be able to, to take gold, just never really put it all together. So I was, uh, I, I really wanted to, to make that happen. And, uh, they, they ran the, uh, the, the X games in the U S bank stadium right there in downtown Minneapolis. But, uh, we, we had the year before we had ran out in the, the mall of America parking lot and, and they built a, you know, a bigger racetrack out in a parking lot. And this year they decided to run the, the track, uh, in, inside the stadium and they, had, they tore down all the FMX jumps, you know, the, the landing, landing ramps and stuff for FMX, uh, uh, the night that was the night before. And they, they tore those down, uh, overnight and laid us out a short track, uh, in a matter of, you know, less than 12 hours. And, and the, the track kind of showed from it. It was, it was, it was not a good race track. I mean, it was, uh, uh the surface was super rough and inconsistent and it was kind of just like a, a big circle, you know? So, uh, wrestling these uh, hundred horsepower, 300 pound, uh, twin cylinder engines around this, uh, oblong shape, rough, inconsistent short track was, uh, was, was pretty, was pretty brutal. You know, there's, there's quite a few guys before I crashed that had crashed or, or there's a lot of almost crashes and stuff. So, I mean, it was, it was just kind of a, a little bit of a war zone out there. Um, and, uh, it was, it was a stupid crash really. I mean, I, I was coming, I was like the last qualifying session and I was coming off of uh turn two and I, I'd had my, my, my bike set up was a little off and whatnot. And it's kind of, I guess, make a long story short, this, the, I, I came off of turn two and, and bike was sideways. You know, you always steer the motorcycle uh, around the racetrack, around the corners, you know, with, with the slide and, especially with how round it was, you know, the key, you know, keep the motorcycle spun up and, and steering with the, the rear tire. And I was talking about it being kind of rough. There was a, some ruts coming off the corner. So when I was sideways, the, the motorcycle caught a rut. And when it caught that rut, I went from wheel spinning to the bike hooking up right away. So it immediately brought the front end up in the air, like in a wheelie, like I was going to flip over backwards because the bike caught traction so quickly. And I was in between Jeffrey Carver and, and Jared Mees. Jeffrey was right in front of me and, and Jared was right behind me. So Jared or Jeffrey was right, right in front of me. And, and I remember, you know, getting the bike, spinning the bike sideways and getting it kind of pivoted around the where I could try to get a good run on Jeffrey to, to, to pass them going into turn three. So I was super close to the backside of Jeff. So when that bike came up in a wheelie and launched forward so quick, I mean, I stabbed the rear brake 
to, to bring the front end back down for one, not to wheelie over backwards and two, not to run right in the backside of Jeff. So when I stabbed the front brake and just with how quickly the front end, you know, violently it came back down. Um, and then the, the, the rear like suspension kind of preloaded it just like it, it basically like my, my arms buckled. And like, so it was like, almost like I was flat landing off a motocross jump, you know, like my arms buckled and it threw me over the front and then how the rear suspension kind of preloaded and, and, and bucked my, my ass off the seat, you know, it basically just kind of threw me over the front of the, of the motorcycle to where I was basically surfing on the crossbar pad of the, of, of the handlebars, you know, and looking down at the front tire. And that's, that's the last I remember was, was, you know, kind of being over at the front end, you know, being laying on top of the bars, looking down at the front tire. And, um, this was the way I landed. I mean, the, the video you watch it and you just kind of look like, Oh, that was, that wasn't too bad. You know, you would have thought that, uh, you know, I would have got right back up the kind of way the landed where I, but <clears throat> the way I landed, I landed on top of my head to where like I, I basically kind of like pivoted off of my head to where I kind of scorpioned, you know, and I think just the, the, the compression and the roll of my back that it, it just, uh, something, something had to give, you know, and, uh, it, it broke my back, uh, right at T six level. So like right below your chest and it, it knocked me out when I, when I crashed and I, and when I woke up, I just had a, a piercing pain, you know, right here in my chest. And, you know, you, you look down at your legs and you, you can't feel your legs. You can't move your legs. And it's just the freaking scariest, scariest thing that you can ever think of, you know, like you, you kind of just immediately know, like, I'm um, I'm screwed. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. this is like, you, you know, what happened, you know, like with between, you know, we, we've all had, you know, in, in motorsports, unfortunately, we've all had friends that have either been paralyzed or, or killed, you know, um, or both. Um, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so I pretty much knew that, you know, what, it, what had happened, you know, so, um, you know, it, uh, I, I just, I remember being, uh, you know, on the stretcher and being uh, carted off the, off the, off the track. And, um, you know, my, my girlfriend now, now fiance and my mechanic and one of my best friends, Brandon Bergen, who's one of my, my, my best friends, still one of my best friends was, was my mechanic on the Indian team was cool. And, and then, then my brother, you know, one of my best friends, now my best man in my wedding going to be, he, he was, you know, my friend from Minnesota, they weren't able to, to, to make it onto the racetrack because they want to let them. And I remember, you know, Brandon going like, Hey, what, what, what's wrong, man? What's wrong? And I just remember going like, it, it paralyzed me, dude. And, and he was just like, what, you know, like, like then none of them, no one of them thought it was that bad, you know, like, um, like I wasn't getting up, but they thought that, you know, none of them knew what had happened. Like none of them would have thought that it paralyzed me or I broke my back from just like, how you know not how how kind of not necessarily wimpy but not how bad as it would that it looked like something like that would happen you know but obviously that 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 made it a lot more <clears throat> real for them at, at that point um but uh i guess fortunately being in downtown minneapolis the uh the hospital was like kitty corner to, to the the stadium so I, I didn't have very far to go to, to, to make it to the, the hospital. And, um, you know, th- that's when, you know, really reality sat in for everybody, you know, to find out that I had broken my T six, seven and eight, um, vertebrae and, uh, that, uh, and obviously I'd had a, a spinal cord injury. Um, yeah. and, you know, l- luckily as well, you know, it was, There was a really, really good surgeon uh, in in Minneapolis, and um, she, uh, Doctor Sam Donning, we went in for emergency surgery to to you know to to set my back to to you know to remove pressure off my spinal cord, set everything, and and infuse my back. So like I, I ended up getting 
fuse from like T2 to T10. So like my whole upper thoracic spine is, is, is all fused together now. Um, but, uh, it was, it was just good to have, uh, such a good doctor, you know, right there on, on hand. Uh, and, and also very, very fortunate that, uh, my, my fiance, she's a registered nurse and she, you know, immediately went into nurse mode and making sure that, uh, that everything was, was, was being done properly, you know, like actually the, they, they weren't going to do surgery on me right away. They were going to wait a while, like wait two days. Like the, 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 the one neurosurgeon that was on call wasn't, uh, wasn't going to do surgery right away. And, and Kelsey knew that that was, was wrong. That like the, you know, if you, the quicker that we can get in and, and relieve pressure off my spinal cord, the, the more, you know, possibility of recovery or, or it just being better. So she, you know, started to talk to nurses and say that, and they, they agreed with her and they actually, the one nurse knew that Dr. Samadani was, was really adamant about, yeah, the emergency surgery and gave her a call and she said, okay, like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be right there. So like, without having Kelsey there and knowing that, uh, you know, maybe would have waited a little while longer. And, and even though you see me, I'm, I'm still in a wheelchair now, but I, I do, I do have a certain amount of feeling and I do have a certain amount of, uh, you know, function. Um, and, uh, maybe if we would have waited that, you know, extra time, maybe I would be, considered a, a complete injury where you you know don't have any any sensory or any uh you know function you know because you get sensory is sensory you know from the legs or lower extremities to the brain and functions brain to the lower extremities you know so maybe i did not have any of that and so you know thankfully i I do because it, it does, you know, in, increase my quality of life. Uh, even though, like I said, I'm still in the wheelchair, it still, it, it does increase my quality of life. So, um, yeah, being, being, uh, yeah, having, having all that on my, um, on my side w was great. Um, and then it was just, a a long, long road to recovery after that. I mean, from going then after you're in the hospital, then you go to inpatient care, um, which I went to Chicago, Illinois to, uh, it's a number one, uh, rehab facility for spinal cord injury and, and brain injuries for the last 20, well, going on 29 years now. Um, so that was, uh, couldn't have gone to a better place to, 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 to rehab, but you kind of, it's, it's a harsh reality when you go there too, because you think that you go in there to like learn how to walk again and learn how to, okay, this is going to be recovery, like breaking your leg or dislocating a shoulder that, okay, I just go in and, and things start to heal and things start to come back and you start to make things strong again and you learn how to do stuff and life goes back to normal. It's not like that with a spinal cord injury, you know, not, not for the most of us, at least there's, there's, there's a certain, every spinal cord injury is different. And some people you, you some people get back everything. Some people get back a little bit. Some people get back nothing at all. You know, it's just like the, the nervous system is, is crazy how it works. Um, so like when I get there, you know, yeah, I'm kind of pumped up that, okay, I'm very optimistic that more is, you know, everything's going to come back and I'm going to make a full recovery, you know, and, and you got to stay that way. And I'm, I'm still that way to a certain extent, not thinking that they, this isn't the end more is going to come back, but you know, you get there and then you realize, okay, they're teaching you how to live in a wheelchair. They're not teaching you how to walk again. They're, they're teaching you how to live your life in a wheelchair and, and without the use of, you know, three quarters of your body. So that's, that's kind of a harsh reality that, that you go there and you're like, okay. And then, then you, then you see all sorts of other people of, of different injuries, people that have broke their neck and, uh, you know, it's like, then it's affects all four limbs, you know, and then you kind of realize how, okay, this sucks, but it could be worse, you know, and, you know, you know, use that as, 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 you know, the way to be thankful and motivation, but, uh, yeah, so went through inpatient rehab and then, then it's, then it's going home and getting back into life, but also 
continue in your rehab because the first, especially the first two to three years is when you get the most, you know, they say at least you get the most back in the first, you know, two to three years. So you, the work doesn't stop when you get out of therapy. It, it, it continues on really for the, the rest of your life. You know, it becomes a lifestyle. And so you got to, from one, got to learn how to cope with the fact of, you know, you know, losing the, the loss of your legs and, and living life in a wheelchair. But then you got to learn how to, to get back into life and learn how to make a, you know, what you're going to do to make a living again and how are you going to do things, you know? So it's just, uh, it's a, it's a long process and I'm, and I'm, and I'm still in part of that process. Um, you know, even almost two and a half years after it, but, uh, you know, luckily, luckily for me, you know, being, uh, you know, a top competitor in the sport, I, I had made such a name for myself and established myself in the industry to where I had had something to fall back on to where, um, you know, I, I'd always had plans of, of commentating. Uh, I thought I'd be good at it. Um, just because, uh, you know, the, how well I was on the podium being a spokesman for, for different brands and just talking on the podium and, and, and just being a ambassador for the sport. I, I thought that I'd be a, a decent color commentator. So, um, I, I immediately, uh, you know, started to pursue that. And, uh, and luckily Indian was, was, was amazing. Um, you know, like 2019 was the third year of my contract as to race for them. And they, they kept me on and, and fulfilled my, my, my contract, but, uh, but, uh, made me to be the, the, uh, a racer, a rider coach for both, uh, Bronson and Briar Bauman, the two new riders on the team. So being the, uh, the, the, the rider coach for them and helping them out, advising them, that was awesome. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the commentary was cool too. I mean, I, I started out a little bit shaky, but every race I got a little bit better, a little bit more comfortable and, and, uh, Scotty Dubler, who I do the, uh, the commentary with, I, I'd known him really well and, and obviously spoke to him many times on the podium. So we almost felt like we'd done that before. You know, and uh, so yeah, just being able to to bring bring insight to the fans that really not anybody else would know, you know, other than another current racer. Um, but yeah, it had to be a current racer. Even like I say, like Chris Carr did it for a long time, but and he is fairly current, but it's not as current as somebody that has done it in the last couple of years and has grown up with basically all the guys that are doing it now. You know, so I just had insight and knowledge that nobody else would do, and I knew how to speak it and deliver it in a way that, uh, that everybody understood and, and can connect with. So, um, having, you know, that, that role in the sport has, has been, been cool. And then, and then Briar won his first grand national championship and being able to be a smart, small part of that, uh, of, of helping a rider win a, a grand national championship is, was cool. And Bronson got third his best finish in the championship. And then, Briar, you know, wrapped it up again this, you know, this year. Um, and you know, I, I, the people that have been around me have been the most paramount uh, of this recovery. I mean, between my, my fiance and her family and, and my family and, and, and especially my, my friends, which are like my extended family. I mean, those, those are the people that have had made the, the, the ultimate, you know, uh, difference in this whole, this whole deal, you know, and, and luckily I, I had all those people, you know, like a very fortunate person to have a lot of amazing friends, a lot of great people in my life and, a and, a you know, awesome fans. And just, uh, it, it made my transition into this new life, uh, so much easier, you know, or better, you know, maybe not easier, but better than what, uh, than, than what it could have been, you know, and some people that might not have that, that, that great support group, you know? So, um, you know, it, yeah, like I said, it's just, it's been different. It's definitely been different. It's been, it, it's, uh, it's been hard, really hard. I mean, the hardest thing that I've, I've ever been through, you know, and, and when I say, good, you know, there's so much still to live for life. And I mean, I, I, I do more things and, 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 I do more things and, and, and do funner things, you know, still than a lot of people do that are, that are able-bodied. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. But, uh, 
I I miss my my old life of 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 being a professional motorcycle racer and 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 doing the things that we just spent the first half of this talking about. You know, I'm, I miss that dearly. But uh, at at the same time, uh, I'm 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 happy with where life is right now and 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 where it's going and what I'm doing. Um, and it's very far from being over. Definitely, definitely, mate. Definitely, just uh, you're such a positive person. You know, you put you've put like everything from the day that you put a positive light on each part of it. You know, what could be a real, uh, you know, very very difficult thing. You've, you've you've tried to be such a positive person about it. I guess so. For for sure, man. That's 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 all you can do. You know, it's like you can if you dwell on it and uh, you just kind of she. You know, you could shut down and do nothing. You know, but it's like that's not going to do you any good. I mean, it's like who wants to just be miserable all the time. I yeah. I actually listened to a Doug Henry podcast uh, last night and he kind of put it that way. It's like, Hey man, it's like, who wants to be miserable? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're either going to, you know, have to be positive and be happy or you're going to choose to be negative and miserable. And obviously the positive and happy sounds a lot better than the negative and miserable, you know? So, um, you know, just, just keep moving forward and, and you just realize that, Hey, you're, you're not the only one, you know, this is this, there's been so many athletes that this has happened to, you know, and, and worse, you know, like obviously like, uh, I think of, uh, all my friends that I've, I've lost doing this, you know, mm. and, uh, they, they, they really paid the ultimate sacrifice, but I, I know that they would be so much more happier being here in my position than they would be being gone. You know, they'd, they'd rather be sitting here in a wheelchair being with still be here on this earth than they would be being gone. So, I mean, I guess, uh, and I, and I know in the sport that I do, it's like, there's so many incidents instances where I, you know, I could have died, you know, if it just went a little bit worse off, you know, or something happened when I was, you know, running into the corner at 130 miles per hour inches away from guardrails and posts, you know, it's like, you, you really just like, yeah, as a racer, I guess you, you understand that a little bit more than, you know, say the average person. I'm gathering and, and I, I call it this and you probably do as well. You've probably been through your life where you've laid on the, on a track or something and done like a systems check where you, you, you know, you, you, yeah. you, that sort of thing, I guess that, that's probably happened many times as well. Like, you know, fortunate times, obviously, as well in the past. For sure. Everybody, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. You're like legs, arms, uh, you know, everything's okay. You know, it's like something might hurt, but uh, there's nothing, nothing traumatic here, you know? And, uh, or, or you had one of them really crazy, oh shit moments. And yeah. you go like, my God, that could have gone really bad, you know? Thank yeah. God it didn't because if it went this little, if it did, I was like, who knows what would have what, what happened, you know? So mm-hmm. you also know those times. And I think I've had, I think I've had more, oh shit moments than I have those times where I've been laying on the track with a system check, you know, I've yeah. kind of had those like, oh crap, like, yeah, that, that could have been bad, you know, and, and know that if it did that all these other, you know, things that you've seen happen to people could have happened, you know? You know, when you said to me uh, about you breaking your leg, did you stay? Yeah. Did you stay on the bike? When that rocket? Yeah. No, I never crashed. Never crashed. It just yeah. No, I mean, I, I didn't finish the race. That's for sure. Wow. Yeah, I just broke my leg. Yeah, I got a got a scar scar right here. Yeah, Man, that's crazy. this was like right right above the boot line. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had to be like a fist size golf ball size rock. But I mean, yeah. I was on the back straightaway. Yeah, back straightaway of a very fast half mile. So I had to be going eighty to ninety miles per hour in whatever that rock is being kicked off back at me. So say it's going the same. I mean, that's a hundred eighty mile per hour fastball you know, cool. even if it's just a golf ball, you know, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, bullet, it just, uh, but it hit me in between my, my leg and just above my boot line where there really wasn't any padding other than this leather, you know? So it was, yeah. it just kind of took my bone 
and like it looked like a windshield that got hit by a rock and just kind of went poof, you know just a bunch of hairline cracks and uh and it hurt really 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 bad because it just with all those hairline fractures you know looking like a a windshield that got spider web by a rock you know it like uh just affected so many different nerve endings and it it yeah it, it hurt really bad <laughs> probably the worst feeling that i ever had actually really and so, it's not. yeah that, yeah 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 for sure more so than the back injury yeah the back injury like uh it, it hurt but uh it was uh it wasn't like an excruciating pain you know and uh it is kind of the system went numb at that time where uh, with the leg it was like i can freaking feel everything then, you know oh, <laughs> yeah 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 big time for sure so yeah i went went into the corner and was like you know set you know scream some cuss words in my head uh, you know in my helmet at first and then went into the corner and was like okay and then i went into went around that corner I'm like, okay maybe it's okay and then i went into turn one and i tried putting my foot down and i was like yep it's not okay <laughs> and and then i uh, uh I, I went I went to pull off the outside of the track and uh, they had to open up the fence for me and I was trying like riding around like trying to find where the ambulance was and the ambulance was in the infield of the track and I was like shit so then I had to sit there and wait for the you know the ambulance to to come back around after the race was done and then I, I didn't end up taking the ambulance ride anyhow just because I didn't want to pay for it so we hopped in the pickup and then went to the, to the, to the hospital, you know, so I'm guessing so, same as Australia, yeah. like it'd be an expensive ride in an ambulance, I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, well, for sure. I mean, it, it would be, I mean, obviously if you have insurance that probably pays for a portion of it, but, uh, um, you know, that's only a portion of it. So if you, if you can go without it, then it's probably smart to do it. Yeah. Well, mate, it's I know it's late Thursday night over there. I'm gonna hold you for five five more minutes. Tell me about a special day in racing life. Okay, no worries, man. What's been a special day in racing life? Uh, a special day in racing life. Um I'd say maybe my, my first grand national win uh as an expert. Um mm -hmm. that was uh Hagerstown, Maryland in, in, in twenty thirteen. Um yep. you know, it's like everybody like you, you, that, that first win, you know, it's like, that's, that's like, that's, that's probably like, uh, you know, I wouldn't say the ultimate goal, but it's like, well, that's one, that's one of the first, you know, on your way to the ultimate goal, you know? And, um, I, I had spent, you know, uh, my whole life, you know, leading up to, you know, saying that, Hey, I was just best in the world on that day, at least, let alone just best in the world period that year, but this best in the world, this, uh, out of, out of that one day and it, and it happened in in 2013 and at Hagerstown Maryland and that was actually the first uh track that Nikki Hayden had ever won a, a grand national at as well so yeah they do it on the same same racetrack that Nikki won his first national on that was, that was pretty cool um but uh yeah and like I told you about driving in a in a Conaline van you know and and uh you know shoestring budget and helping work on the bikes and doing everything myself. And, you know, it's the way that, that everything, you know, materialated to, to get in that grand national win, uh, was, was, was really cool for sure. Mm. Tell me, uh, inspirations. You just mentioned Nicky Hayden, obviously a flat tracker. Was he someone that you looked up to? Like, cause he's, you know, uh, what 12 years, he would have been 12 years older or 14 years older, maybe as a young, yeah. younger rider. Yeah, for sure. I mean, let's, let's just say uh, him and then a few others, but Nikki was, as was obviously, I think everybody's uh childhood racing hero uh, and just yeah. here, not even a child is your hero in general, you know, at all times. Um, yeah. You know, I remember meeting, seeing Nikki at the first, my first time in uh, amateur nationals in like 2002. Yeah, it was 2002. Cause he was uh still riding like super bike, uh, for yeah. Honda and then racing some, uh, flat track races for, for Honda. And he was at and then 
Uh, so, you know, just following him all the way until he, he won the world championship and, and beyond that, you know, so I think he, yeah, he was, he was definitely uh, a hero of mine. And then, um, uh, Will Davis, he was national number 21. Uh, he, uh, he was another one and I, I never, I never knew Will, but like watching flat track is on TV and stuff as a kid, you know, he, I think he won, I think it might've been the first, uh, first race flat track professional race that I ever watched on TV at Daytona and he won and is number 21. I liked the number 21 and he won quite a few nationals and he, uh, so he was always kind of like a, a hero, you know, to, of mine, you know, watching him and, um, he, he un- unfortunately passed away at a, at a race in Sedalia, Missouri and I think Oh seven or something. And then, uh, and then Jethro Halbert was another one as well. Um, Jethro was, was from Washington state as, as well. So, um, and he was, you know, older than me. So he was, uh, always on a bigger bike, you know, in the amateur class and then turned pro. So he was like the, the faster, you know, pros and stuff around home, but he was just super smooth and had a pretty style on a bike and, and, uh, really humble and, and, and kind off the, off the track as well. So, um, you know, he was one that I looked up to, um, around home and, unfortunately he passed away racing as well so pretty pretty wild to say that all all three of my racing heroes uh yeah died died racing motorcycles i mean obviously nikki got died on a bicycle but died racing or training for bikes you know so it's uh it's a it's a wild wild sport uh Mm -hmm. that we all we all love for sure but uh you know that's that's you know part of the reason why i respect it uh so much Mm -hmm. you know 100 percent it's uh yeah it's one of the yeah it's such a respected sport you know especially among the peers you know people yeah. that understand that it's uh yeah, it's huge um venues yeah it really is man and they're like these guys oh go ahead sorry sorry mate. sorry mate um i was just trying to rush you along there i don't want to uh hold you too much longer venues Tell me about, you know, you've raced Sac- no, Sacramento, you've raced Rossi Ranch, you've raced Tari for the Throat Classic. Um, you're racing some pretty cool places. What's been a fave? Um, yeah, no, I've been, I've been really uh, fortunate to, to race, you know, all over the United States and other parts of the world. And uh, my favorite racetrack was Pomona, California. Um, it was, yeah. you know, Southern California, just, just east of Los Angeles, um, and, a paper clip five eighths mile. You know, I always liked tracks that were paper clips, you know, to where, uh, you really had to, you know, what we we're talking about before flicking the bike sideways and getting it turned with the rear and getting it turned early and making the straightaway as long as possible, you know, to where, you know, they have the the sooner you can get the bike turned and up on top of the tire and driving and pointing, you know, down the straightaway and making that straightaway longer, you know, uh, in paper clip tracks, you really have to do that, you know, and, and yeah, uh, half, you know, Pomona was like half mile, half mile corners and, and, and longer straightaway. So really it was a, a five eighths mile. So you would actually could draft and tuck down the straightaway and then you'd flick it sideways and, and get it turned and, and cushion type material. And, um, yeah, it was this super cool, super cool track to ride. And then being in Southern California, um, it was, you know, always kind of get a good ambiance there. And then I, uh, I, I was always on the podium there and then I wrapped up the grand national championship there in 2013. So yeah, Pomona was definitely, definitely my favorite venue. It's, um, the uh, straight rhythm one that afterwards like they don't run it there anymore for the grand yeah. national studio probably i know yeah they don't and those assholes that run straight rhythm there now they that i <laughs> i just just joking but uh um they for some reason like yeah in 2014 they said that they were gonna that the facility was being sold and the guy who bought it and was gonna build condos there and uh and yeah, the other that the place was being leveled the, the horse the horse, uh, you know, community had was was no longer there, you know. So they, yeah, they they sold it, saying it was going to run con, you know, put condos there, and then 
for the last seven years, you know, six years now, they, mm. it's still there and they just run straight rhythm there. And I think that's the only thing that they do there. It's just, just kind of a vacant facility. So like I've, uh, I've always really wanted to like try to get somebody to promote a national there again, you know, like I think a week with somebody with a road grader and some equipment, this, uh, the, the racetrack, the last time I was there in 2015, after they did straight rhythm, like everything was still there. It just kind of needs to be, yeah, massaged back into a racetrack. So, mm. and maybe never, never know, maybe we'll have a race there again someday. For for flat track people, like the, uh, the perfect way to destroy a racetrack, Chuck jumps in it. <laughs> so yeah exactly for sure you know, yeah um, uh, but hey that, that, that that's nothing but a, a bulldozer and a road yeah. grader and a, and a week of work will we'll smooth all that back out you know <laughs> for sure what's this um what's this cars you're doing what's the what's the next thing it looks like you're trying to get into some uh, sort of racing again what, tell me about that yeah yeah i definitely have um uh, it's a, a micro sprint mm -hmm. uh sprint, sprint car so it's uh, got a 600 cc jixer engine in them you know they got oh, yeah. all like 600 street bike engines in them um and uh yeah it's like a man, like i said a min mini sprint it's like a miniature version of a full-size sprint car um but uh it's probably the most uh most, I want to say most popular, but yeah, most popular, most, uh, you know, competed in class for dirt cars in the States. I mean, there's, they're all over the United States and that's very, very, very competitive. You know, a lot of all the, you know, drivers, they, they cut their teeth, you know, in these micros. Um, but, uh, they got some, got some big races, you know, some, some high purse purse races and, uh, one really big race that they, that they run them at, uh, during the winter called the, uh, the Tulsa shootout. And then there was a chili bowl that a lot of people have heard of with, with midgets. But, uh, um, you know, I always, I always wanted to get into a dirt car even before I got hurt. They just, they just look cool. You know, they're fun, fun to, to, to drive. And, um, so after I got hurt, you know, people asked me if I would have had any desire to get back on a bike. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I, I've gone back on a bike and rode around a little bit, you know, but I don't really want to get back on a bike and do it at a competitive, you know, state kind of like a, a Doug Henry has, you know, it's cause never be able to do it at the level I did before. And I'm, I'm done breaking arms and shoulders and things like that. And so I was like, well, what if I get into a, a, a car, you know, there's not really much that separates me to the able potty person. Uh, you know, I have to get, hand controls and things set up and you know what they say with with age comes the cage it's quite a bit safer it's not safe but it's it's safer um <laughs> so so yeah i i i've uh i've hooked up with with uh with hoosier racing tire and uh they the, the product manager that's been there for 40 years or so his son uh, race motocross and he got paralyzed uh, about 10 years ago and been racing these micros and since then uh, um, you know became good friends with them and and helping them you know produce a an actual new flat track tire with Hoosier and uh, they've helped me get started and uh, to, into uh, micro sprint racing so yeah I've only been out in the car three times now I uh, between you know still being busy going aft racing and whatnot but uh i got out in it twice and i i caught on to it pretty quick i mean it's it's very similar to um very similar to flat track as far as you know steering with the throttle the slide uh just just the feel of it obviously being the feel of being in the car is different but uh, uh the, the feeling of the slide and steering with the throttle and finding traction and everything is 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 very similar um so yeah i mean i'm went out for my first race and uh <laughs> nothing like being thrown in the deep end like you get there and you get three hot laps of practice and then you go racing so it's like wow. yeah, i didn't have any time to get used to the, the the track or dial in the car or anything like that and that's another thing like car setup is way different than bikes you know but uh so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I didn't make the A main feature, but I was not a, a, a squid by any means. Like if I was my third time on a motorcycle, I would have got lapped like 10 times and then I, I wasn't that far off by any means. So I, I feel like with more seat time that, uh, I'll be able to get up to speed with it and be, be competitive, but we'll, we'll just see where it goes. You know, right now I'm, I'm just doing it for fun. You know, I 
call it throttle therapy, so to speak, you know, um, it's best sort of throttle, you know, therapy you can get and being able to get an adrenaline rush. And, uh, yeah, just, just have fun with it, but you never know what it might run into. Um, maybe I'll be able to go somewhere with it, but right now I'm just gonna just do it for fun and, and yeah, just see where it goes. And, and is it giving you, you know, you got to scratch that itch. Is it, is it doing that? Do you feel? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Def, definitely scratch the itch for sure. I mean, it's, uh, it does that. It does. Yeah, it definitely does do that. It's, it's a lot of fun, you know, like it, I mean, it, it'll never really fully, you know, fill the hole of riding a motorcycle, you know, and stuff that I got to do on a motorcycle. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing like the feeling of, of, of riding a motorcycle. I, I don't believe, but this is just a micro. I mean, when you get into a sprint car, I mean, that's 900 to 1200 horsepower. And I mean, those things are freaking wicked. So it depends on where I go with it. I mean, I want to get into a bigger car. So I guess I say that, but I don't know that yet. Yeah. Maybe, you know, I feel like 900 to 1200 horsepower naturally aspirated, and going a hundred and I mean, those things go like 160 on a half mile. I mean, they're, it's crazy how fast they right. are. So no joke, if I ever get in one of those, maybe, yeah, no joke at all. Maybe, maybe it will, uh, scratch that itch even more, but it helps. And it definitely, you know, between being a part of racing and helping out flat track still and doing this, it, it, it definitely helps for sure. And you just mentioned the name on, uh, pick your brain on who's here. They're making inroads on the motorcycle flat track scene, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they definitely are. I mean, um, uh, if everybody knows, uh, you know, the Hoosier is like one of the household names when it comes to, you know, sprint car racing and, and, uh, and, and, and oval, you know, asphalt racing um, and they're a uh, competition tire only. I mean, it's been a breath of fresh air working with those guys. I mean, they have so much knowledge from their years of, of, uh, of dirt car racing that they have a lot of stuff that they can transfer over to the flat track tire, but yeah, they already have a, a, a really good motocross tire. They've been doing that for a couple of years and everybody I've talked to says that the motocross tire is really good. And, um, just with them, just barely scratching the surface, uh, with the flat track tire, it's already really well. And we're, we've, we've came out the second mold now and going to start, you know, developing the second generation tire here soon. So, I really feel like it when it's all said and done that that Hoosier's going to have one of the most superior tires and flat tracks ever seen for sure. Wow, yeah, I've seen. Uh, there's a guy over here that's just built up a, a KDM uh, single, and he's just chucked a set of Hoosiers on it. It's the first time mm -hmm. I've seen them. I was like, wow. I say, um, yeah, really. Okay, so yeah, Project Flat Track is his Instagram uh, handle. He's basically done like a full okay. factory his own factory kdm it's pretty cool nice that's awesome well, that's cool to see that they got them over there because i i know obviously they sell hoosier tires in australia with all the uh the sprint car racing and stuff mm. that that happens down there so um that's one thing i've talked about like i said with my friends that i know they're from australia i'm gonna make a make a trip down to australia here here sometime soon i mean obviously when when covid ends was thinking about doing it this winter but uh not gonna happen this winter but maybe uh when i do make a trip down there i'll be able to get myself into a dirt car and go play around a little bit down under it's yeah for sure i look forward to it it's a popular sport down here like it's our summer uh summer sport so your winter so like you said, if you're coming down that time, it's a uh, good time to sort of do it. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And then I can get out of the snow and ice up here and come down and play around with you guys in the summer. So it uh, totally yeah. makes sense. Well, you've got so much to uh, yeah. give to the sport, right. mate. Still having to build by commentary. You're still doing coaching. Um, obviously, some technical stuff with Indian. Um, you're still in it. Yeah, for sure, man. I'm I'm doing as much as I possibly can. Like you said, moving moving forward and and, and just doing the best with what I got and and uh, you know just trying to help out the sport, the riders, everybody as much as I can. And and uh, you know just transitioned into uh, uh, another another role, you know, and maybe this role will be more important than 
what I was doing before, you know? Makes sense. Well, mate, we've gone for two hours. Um, mate, just thank you so much for your time. Like, we've been messaging for probably a month. You've been traveling around, I've been traveling around, and yeah, thanks so much for, um, for giving me two hours of your time on the Thursday night, mate. Hey, my, my pleasure, mate. It's, uh, it's been a, been, been awesome. Been a pleasure. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's cool. Like I said, I, Australia has a, a special place in my heart. It's, uh, it's awesome. And I, I, I look forward to make it down there and thank you for everybody that's listening and just, yeah, thank you for, for having me on very much. No dramas. And if there's anything that we can, uh, do for you while you, while you're over here, when you do, um, when the world settles down and you do come here, um, just sing out where where we're based is uh, probably twenty minutes past the Davies family. So yeah, anytime, just sing out, mate. Oh really? Right on. Well, I'll definitely hit you up. We'll have to get together for a beer or something. Sounds good, mate.